Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another live stream here on Dream Bank's page. My name is Andy Frisky. I am a senior dream curator. Really excited to introduce the featured speaker today, Nick Myers. Um, and I, again, I'd like to welcome everybody, especially the first time viewers today. So I want to shed a little bit about as to who we are and why we are here. Dream Bank is a free community resource that is put on by American Family Insurance. We are located in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin. And everything that we do ladders up towards the inspiration and pursuit of dreams, in large part that's done through the programs that we offer. So we host right around 25 free events a month virtually currently right now uh, that are organized into 11 different buckets. So anything ranging from uh, this event today, which falls into our business series. We also have a learning lab, which is kind of a how to or a 101 series. We have a think and explore series, which is all based around curiosities and conversations surrounding the future family related activities, fitness events uh, every Fridays and, and other days during the week and many more. So if you are tuning in to our Facebook page, go ahead and press that events tab and that'll give you a good concise list of what we have coming up and also all of the events that we produce since the beginning of the pandemic. So right around the end of March, 2020, if you're viewing this on LinkedIn, go ahead and head over to our Facebook page and that'll give you again, a good concise list of our offerings. But let me go ahead and jump into our speaker today, Nick Myers. So Nick is the founder and CEO of Red Fox AI based in Madison, Wisconsin. Red Fox AI is a voice technology company for innovative biotech organizations that want their at-home diagnostic testing efforts to be more frictionless, cost-effective, and successful. Nick is a TEDx and an international keynote speaker having spoken at events and conferences across the United States and the world on topics ranging from AI and the future of work. AI in the future of social media, and how brands can effectively use voice technologies like Alexa, Google Assistants to enhance their marketing and customer engagement strategy. Nick has been featured in, has been featured publications like PR Daily, In Business Madison, and the Journal of Digital and Social Media Marketing. In 2019, Red Fox AI was recognized as a 50 on fire company in the state of Wisconsin by Wisconsin Inno. Nick is an In Business Madison 40 Under 40 award winner and was nominated as Voice Commentator of the Year at the 2019 Project Voice Awards. Nick is also the host of the Artificial Podcast, a weekly podcast series where he interviews emerging technology experts and practitioners around the world to help everyone understand how emerging tech is impacting our lives both personally and within our organizations. Today, he's going to be talking about data, especially within your smartphone. Please help me welcome Nick Myers. Nick, I'm going to kick it over to you. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Andy, for that awesome intro. I'm excited to be back presenting for Dream Bank. Of course, I, I always appreciate when you guys invite me to speak just because I feel like every time I do come to speak, uh, whether that be in person or virtual, I, I feel like I always have something new to talk about just because there's so much going on in the tech world right now and, and everything that we're working on at Red Fox AI with voice technology specifically, there's just always something new. And what I'll be talking about today is actually the first talk of this kind I'll be getting, giving rather, that is very focused on data privacy. And I'll be honest, about a year, well, I should say up until about several months ago, from the nature of the work we do, I was very much, eh, data's being collected on us all the time. It's just something we all have to get used to, yada, 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 yada. Well, that mindset for me has changed a bit, and the reason being, I am actively involved in an organization called the Open Voice Network. I've been involved since early 2020, and I'm very invested in our privacy and security work group as we're coming up with standards for voice data privacy, essentially. And doing the work that we have done so far in that group has peeled back the different onion layers, if you will, of data privacy for me and, and my whole thought process on how data should be treated, ownership of data, all of that has just changed significantly. And nobody's really, I mean, people are talking about it, but is anybody really talking about it? I feel like it gets brought up and then, you know, oh yeah, data privacy, and it, it just kind of gets glossed over unless, of course, there's a massive data breach or different things like that. So my whole goal with this talk today is to lay everything out on the table in terms of data privacy, how data is being collected, where it's stored, and ultimately what we could do to start demanding more out of data collectors, because that needs to happen. The longer we spend in this current environment where I can't even begin to tell you how much data is collected, but the longer we, we sit in this environment, 
the more data is going to be collected and used in ways that we may not necessarily agree with. So I may come across in this talk as though I'm bashing the social media companies and internet, but that's not, that, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just being incredibly real with where we are at and how the system currently works. You can be aware of it so you can start being more cognizant of your data. So with that intro out of the way, I say let's get into it. So the big question and probably the question that maybe drew you in to this talk today is your smartphone listening. And I would have to imagine that you have thought about this at some point. I know I have. I've thought about it for a very long time, but it was one of those things, again, where up until several months ago, I was just like, eh, it's the nature of technology. It's the nature of connected devices. Our data is just collected. My smartphone is probably listening to me, but I get those awesome personalized ads wherever I go on the Internet. So I don't know, of course, how many people are currently watching, but... If you have an idea or if you have an answer to, is your smartphone listening, go ahead and place your answer in, in the comments or um, I, I just would really like a solid idea of, of what you think. But this question has been on everyone's mind for a number of years. And I think it really started gaining prominence as we realized, wow, the ads that we're getting on Facebook specifically are really, really specific. Even Google search, the ads that we're getting on Google search, display ads, and when you type in certain keywords in the ads that appear in even YouTube ads, are getting really specific. So it's hard not to think that our smartphones are listening to us because of how specific these ads are getting. I got an ad around Mother's Day last year about a personalized mug I could order for my mom that somehow they knew I was living in Wisconsin and my mom was in Illinois and there was a picture of Wisconsin and Illinois on the mug and it was something about you may be apart but always forever blah blah whatever it was just really specific and it was almost scary and I'd gotten ads like that before but maybe it was just because of the work I was doing with the open voice network that this really stood out to me but this whole question of is your smartphone listening is on everyone's minds so if you've been asking this you're not alone but to put this into some perspective, in a recent survey conducted by Forbes and Nick's Play in 2019, which is two years old, but the data is still relatively relevant, you know, 60% of millennials think their smartphone is listening to them. So that's millennials. This is the generation that has grown up with a very wide access to technology an incredible familiarity with technology. 60% think that their smartphone is listening to them. And 55% of U.S. adults think their smartphone is listening to them. So just over more than half the population think that they're being listened to with their smartphones, more in part because of how specific the ads on social media and websites have gotten. So I guess to maybe let, let's dive into this question a bit. Is your smartphone listening? Well, after doing a lot of research into this, it is most certainly possible, but really not practical. Technically, any internet-enabled device with a mic can be hacked or be used by an app or even the smartphone provider like Apple or uh, Google Android, but the odds are very slim. Why? Well, in a 2017-2018 Northwestern University study, they tested more than 17,000 Android apps specifically and did not find a single instance of any app activating the microphone to listen to you. On top of that, Accurately translating audio into text for analysis would require a lot of computing power. And we do have a lot of computing power, but imagine databasing everybody's conversation, transcribing that into text and going through it. It's just so much. What makes it, it doesn't make it practical to do so. Now, of course, we know that voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant do collect audio data. But if you dive into the privacy policies, which is really the only thing we can go off of, it's only used for research and training purposes and to tailor the experience for you using these different voice assistants or so what the privacy policies say, right? And they, honestly, you don't necessarily need to collect information 
through the mic on somebody's smartphone because there are many ways for companies and hackers to collect data. And there is no shortage of effective options, right? We have cookie tracking in almost every single website, GPS tracking native in all of our smartphones. Honestly, by just asking for it, how many times have you visited a website or signed up for a service on the web and you just freely give your name? You give your email address, you give your address, I mean, just by asking for it. And then, of course, Facebook Pixel, which is a script that you install into any website that sends data back to Facebook so they can monitor web analytics. So you don't necessarily need a mic to get all this data because there are already so many different ways for companies and nefarious actors such as hackers to collect this data. But I think one statistic that really stands out to me to put the scope of all of this into perspective is 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created every day. And that's from 2019 still, by the way. So it's probably, it's not even probably, it is even more now, but 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created every day. That is such a large number I, 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 it's hard for my brain to even process that, right? In 2020, humans created 1.7 megabytes of data every second. And by 2025, it is expected that 200 zettabytes, yeah, that's right, zettabytes of data will be in cloud storage around the globe. Until putting this talk together, I've never even heard of a zettabyte. And I'm in technology, so that just shows you how much data is out there but more than 200 zettabytes of data will be in cloud storage by 2025. By 2022, 70% of the globe's gross domestic product, GDP, will have undergone digitization. So with just a few of these statistics in mind and the ones staring at you on the screen, I think we all can agree the future is not in purely physical things anymore. We've known this for a while, but when you consider how much data is being generated day by day, it's not in physical things. The future is in digital things, the digital world, or physical things that harness the power of digital. Digital is wrapped up in there somehow and will continue to be forever moving forward. And for a lot of people, of course, this is still a very tough concept to grasp because we've been so used to physical things for so many, I mean, hundreds of years, relatively speaking. And it is this immense explosion of digitization, the amount of data we're creating, that has also led to this explosion in cryptocurrency, right? Like, I know it may just seem top of mind over the last year or two because of how well Bitcoin has been doing, I guess, except for this weekend. But you get my point. And it's this focus on digital infrastructure and all of this data that has led to such an explosion in cryptocurrency because there are millions of people who now firmly believe that we will be moving away from a physical dollar like we have now into an internet-based currency. If everything else is being digitized, why can't currency? So a lot of data out there, folks. A lot of data. But with all of that data being collected, how is it actually being collected? And this is something that is very important to understand in this whole picture. So how is data collected? Well, if we look at just information and data in general, information and data themselves can be collected in a multitude of ways. So we look at conventional data collection, right, where it, it's a very physical process. We have person-to-person -person conversations, surveys, questionnaires, etc. It's, it's a very time-consuming process when you look at conventional data collection. And that's how we've been doing it again for hundreds of years, is we go through this long, arduous process of collecting data typically from a physical means. Well, when we look at digital data, digital data can be collected instantly, 24-7, without us even realizing it. If you look at conventional data collection, you know, we know we're in a conversation if we're sharing data. We know we're taking a survey. We know we're answering a questionnaire. But when we scroll through websites, when we engage in mobile apps, when we go on social media, we, we don't even realize, we can't even fathom the scope of how much data is being collected, which makes it so powerful because it's instantaneous and we don't realize it's happening. And... For the purpose of this talk today, we will only be focusing, of course, on the digital side of data collection. Now, there are a multitude, again, of different ways as to how data is collected in the digital world. But for the purpose of this talk, I've narrowed it down to the three most important ones, or the, the three that I view as the most important in terms of data collection. So when we look at how data is collected, 
We have websites, we have mobile apps, and we have IoT devices. So when we look at these three different sources of data collection, I think it's safe to say that we're exposed to these on a daily basis. In 2021, I mean, it's almost impossible to not visit a website every day, right? Either to check the news, look up bank information, look up stuff at the grocery store. I mean, we're accessing a website constantly. Mobile apps, again, we are in the age of smartphones. Everybody has dozens of mobile apps on their phone. If you're using a smartphone, you're using a mobile app. So that, again, that occurs on a daily basis. And, of course, now, specifically over the last 20 years, we have IoT devices. So these are any device that is connected to the Internet. And there's millions upon millions and soon to be billions of different IoT devices out there that exist right now that are constantly collecting data and reporting that back to the Internet or to the server of the entity that owns that IoT device or the service. So let's dive into these real quick. So websites. So the two primary, again, there is so many different ways that a website can collect data, but the two primary ways are cookie tracking and search engine keywords. So you more than likely have heard of cookies, web cookies, or cookie tracking. And cookie tracking has been around since the heyday of the Internet. They've been around for a very long time. But what exactly is an HTTP cookie or a web cookie? So HTTP cookie tracking essentially monitors and remembers what you do on a website. These are lines of code that exist within every website that, of course, are invisible. We don't know they're there but they monitor and remember what you do on a website. So the reason that a website remembers your login information is because of a cookie. The reason that Google Analytics is able to pick up how many pages of your website were viewed, that is because of a cookie. Uh, basically anything you do on a website is saved locally on your computer as long as it has cookies. And the reason being it's not nefarious, it makes for a better experience because I know it's, I hate it when I go to a website that I haven't logged into for a while, that I had logged into a while ago, and I have to re-enter my login information. But with cookies, that login information is always remembered, which enhances the overall experience, especially if it's an e-commerce site, and makes the transaction go a lot quicker. As a matter of fact, e-commerce sites are some of the largest users of internet cookies. Why? Because when you add something to a shopping cart, that cookie within the website remembers what you had. So if you leave the site and come back, your shopping cart is still full, so you don't have to go through and remember what you put in there, which is beneficial to both the e-commerce company and is beneficial to both the consumer. And, of course, we have Google Analytics. You can install a script within a website that reports all of your page view data, session data. I mean, you can get so nitty-gritty within Google Analytics, it's unreal, but I, I, I've seldom come across a website these days that does not have Google Analytics installed that's reporting that information to Google, but also, of course, the website owner so they can monitor the traffic. Then we have Facebook Pixel, right? So Facebook Pixel is something that's been around really since Facebook has <laughs> has, has really been around, and it tracks interactions on your website, so then that gets reported back to Facebook so you can optimize and make better ads. And again, this is all invisible on every website, so cookie tracking. And of course, you may notice now you go to certain websites and there's a there's like a bar or there's a pop-up that makes you accept cookie tracking. That has to do with GDPR. We'll get into that a bit later. The second way is search engine keywords. So this is maybe more for search engines like Google and Bing and people still use Ask.com and Yahoo. But search engine keywords, of course, are tracked all through the Internet, too, right? So anytime you enter a text string into Google, that is logged, that is remembered, especially if you're signed in to Google Chrome or through a Google account, that information is tied back to your account and personalized, which is why Google has gotten so good at predicting what you're going to search before you even type it. But search engine keywords are a massive part of how websites collect data, how search engines collect data. Mobile apps. So mobile apps, three main ways that mobile apps collect and use data. 
I think the big one here, of course, is GPS and location tracking because every smartphone has GPS built in, has location tracking built in. So when you install a mobile app, a lot of them tend to ask you, are you okay with location tracking? Do you want your location to be monitored? Well, if you accept that, then wherever you go, your location is being pinged back to that mobile app. Uh, and again, there's various reasons why this data is collected to enhance the user experience, sell data to third parties, whatever you have it. But GPS and location tracking is one of the largest sources of data collection through mobile apps on smartphones. The second is something called IDFA, which is more prevalent on iOS devices, but IDFA is a... A, a unique code assigned to your specific smartphone that tracks activity across different websites for marketers. So this has been in the news a lot lately because for the first time, Apple is giving users more control over, uh, users more control over allowing this IDFA code to be used by mobile apps, specifically Facebook and, and Twitter and, and really any, 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 any company that offers a mobile app that wants to use IDFA, but specifically targeted at social media. And of course, Facebook was up in arms because this is how they obtained a lot of their data for th <laughs> to be sold off to advertisers on iOS devices. But that is what IDFA is. So no matter where, if you, if you, if you agree to that tracking, no matter what website you visit, that is then reported back to the mobile app that you agreed to let track you. And then, of course, there's personally identifying information, right? So when you log into a mobile app and you use email address, username, phone number, if you grant access to these things, that is collected. Of course, access to camera, recording audio, uh, read a phone call log, which you cannot do on iOS, by the way, or read SMS messages, also not on iOS. I'll, I'll give Apple credit out of... <laughs> Out of most technology companies today, they are the best with privacy, but they can collect, these mobile apps can collect so much personally identifying information if you allow them to do so. And of course, tracking activity on other apps as well. There are apps that even pull data, like Facebook, from other interactions on different apps that is then all consolidated. So mobile apps and any interaction you have in your smartphone, just a lot of data is being collected every single time you unlock your screen. And of course, lastly, here we have IoT devices. And this one was a bit hard just because it's so device specific, which is also why I included a picture of a Nest thermostat. But a Nest thermostat is a perfect example of an IoT device, right? It's constantly connected to the internet. It's transmitting information about your uh, HVAC system at home, how long it takes to heat or cool your home. It learns over time about how to set the temperature, but it's constantly connected to the internet, constantly reporting data. And of course, if you're logged into an account, now it has your personally identifying information, name, email, username, that is then sent back to the company. But really, IoT devices collect data that are specific to that IoT device or service. So again, smart thermostats, smart speakers, smart doorbells, even self-driving cars, right? So self-driving cars, much like the Tesla self-driving feature, is constantly collecting and reporting data so it can offer that functionality. And really, anything can be turned into an IoT device. I'm serious about this. You can buy, you know, Raspberry Pi kits or small, small IoT kits that can turn any device into an IoT device. And because of that, it's estimated that by 2025, 41.6 billion IoT devices will be in existence. So you can imagine from that number alone how much data is being collected from so many different sources in our day to day lives. So that is how data is primarily collected, or I should say digital data is primarily collected in 2021. But with all of that data being collected, and it's so much, that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, where could it all possibly be stored? Now that is a good question, and I'm going to answer that question for you. The answer is, the answer is, is actually pretty simple and a, and a lot more simple than you probably think and it is servers. All of this data that is being collected is sent to and stored on servers. That's, that's it, it's, it's not more complicated than that. All data is sent to a server. Now, what is a server? In a nutshell, a server is a computer that serves information to other computers. Servers are the backbone of the internet. Anytime you access a website, anytime you use a web software, even a mobile app that has internet connectivity, 
it is using a server to to retrieve and send that information. So without servers, we would not have the internet. And they're crucial to the stable functioning of our day-to-day -day interactions on the internet, but every piece of data that is collected lives on a server somewhere. And in the early days of the internet, individual companies, of course, would have to invest in local server space. So this is on-site servers that you buy and keep either at your facility or maybe a facility that you rent or own that is off-site, but it's still relatively local. It, it's yours. You buy it. And this, this costs companies a lot of money. And of course, because servers and this related software are constantly being upgraded, the investment to have local on-site servers did not last long term. And you'd have to continually spend more and more money over time to maintain and manage your servers. Of course, there's a lot of benefits to that, but in 2021, there's a lot of negatives too. Now, in the late 2000s, everything changed with cloud computing. I shouldn't even say the late 2000s and the mid 2000s, everything changed with cloud computing as it got cheaper and more readily available to everybody. Of course, now the largest cloud computing companies include Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Oracle, Google Cloud, Snowflake, etc. Cloud computing is the true renaissance of the internet and, and really digital transformation as we know it. And when you look at the size, again, of how much data is stored in these cloud services, Amazon Web Service alone accounts for 33.8% of total cloud market share, which is huge. They own so much market share of the cloud space, it's unbelievable. Netflix uses Amazon Web Services. Apple uses Amazon Web Services. Some of the biggest companies that you know and love today tend to use Amazon Web Services. But why? Because they don't have to manage local servers and it makes collecting data so much easier when you're able to spin up a server at the snap of your fingers and scale it as you need it. Incredibly cost effective, but also a great business model for Amazon at the same time. So what are these cloud centers look like, these cloud data centers? Well, on the left here, you have a Facebook data center that at the time of this photo was under construction in Dallas, Fort Worth. They are massive. These data centers are huge. They, they operate on a lot of land, give off a lot of heat, consume a lot of energy, but they're massive. On the right, you have an AWS data center in Northern Virginia. Again, incredibly massive. And Amazon and Facebook both have these massive data centers all over the world. And they keep adding more because the more data they collect and the more users that they have, they need more server space. So they are constantly investing in their cloud services and building these massive, massive data centers. Now, you may be thinking, so instead of just having a local server that's liable, you know, to catch on fire or get attacked or get messed up in some way, now we're just consolidating all the world's data in these siloed data centers that relatively have the same liabilities. Well, the good news is a cloud service like Amazon Web Services or even how Facebook operates their data centers, the risk is incredibly low because of how distributed it is. And a lot of these data centers are highly secured and actually, no joke, are staffed with security that have anti-personnel weapons. I looked into that. Kind of, kind of cool, kind of scary, but they're incredibly well protected. But again, they're massive. They consume a lot of energy, and because they consume so much energy, a lot of the newer data centers are powered completely by solar or wind, which is great. But data is held still in physical spaces, right? It needs to be held physically on servers. All that AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and Oracle have done is they've used economies of scale to provide a lot of server space, a lot of computing power in concentrated locations. And because of that, they're able to keep it incredibly cheap for anybody to use. And Really, this has been a renaissance for specifically technology startups and small to medium-sized businesses. Again, back in the late 90s and even the early 2000s, you had to invest so much money in local servers and local server space, and you would have to constantly upgrade that and burn more money. Now, you can spin up a server within a matter of seconds and pay a very little amount of money depending on how much it is used. So there is a lot of good that comes with... <laughs> With, with all of this data collection and cloud computing. Now, why is all of this data being collected? Is big question there, right? Why is so much data 
being collected? Well, there's a couple of reasons here. Again, this is more what I think. There, there really is no one right or wrong answer. But again, for the purpose of this talk, I've identified three different reasons why all of this data is being collected. Number one, to improve the overall quality of life. Because we can make better and more informed decisions when we have more access to data. So the more data that we have access to, the more and better decisions we're able to make that hopefully will benefit humanity. We can see this in healthcare, right? Food supply, disease prevention. Think about all the data that's being collected specifically over the last year on COVID-19 in real time because of this digital world we're living in. Uh, it, it, it is a certainty that we've been able to develop these vaccines as quickly as we have and keep the public informed as quickly as we have because of that broad and immediate access to data using our digital technology. So really to improve the quality of life is the first reason. And again, that's my optimism shining through. Reason number two is to improve products and services. So companies are always trying to improve their products and services. As we know, we constantly are being sent surveys and different things. But of course, if you're an internet-based company or if you're a company that provides an IoT device or something of, of the sort, you want to know how your users are using it. You want to know the data being collected so you can constantly innovate and optimize your product and services to meet the needs of your customers. Again, think a couple decades ago, this had to be done manually. It took a lot of time. Companies couldn't be nearly as agile, but now they can with this immediate access to data, which is why so much is being collected. Reason number three, of course, I think the one we all know, is advertising. And this is probably, I, I think, one of the biggest ones. I, I, I have this old, this old saying I heard a long ago that marketers ruin everything. It, it's kind of true because no matter <laughs> when a new system gets brought in, we always look for a way to monetize it and, 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 and we just really take advantage of it. I have a marketing background, right? So I can say that. But, um, advertising is, is the number three reason because all of this data is used to build extremely detailed profiles that marketers can then use to advertise products and services. And the old days of marketing was very broad messaging and we were hoping that maybe that broad messaging would, you know, result in a couple of, you know, would result in sales, would result in leads. But now we can be so detailed and so specific with all of this data that we have, we can target the proper customer and the ideal customer to a T, which yes, it's far more efficient, but based on some of the examples I shared a bit earlier, it's also borderline scary. And of course, nowadays it's borderline intrusive, not even borderline, it is intrusive. But this is why all of this data is being collected. So now that we've, we, we've, we've clarified all of that and, and have set the stage is really where I, I get into the social media side of things and now how Access to all of our data and the lack of privacy is contributing to a monster in <laughs> in social media and specifically large internet-based companies. So again, this, this does go into why so much data is being collected. Because data is free, right? We produce data naturally. Our interactions on the web, our interaction with mobile apps, interaction with IoT devices, it's natural. We're using the product and the data is being created naturally and it's free. All of the data that these companies collect is 100% free to them. And you are the product. <laughs> Especially when we look at social media, you are the product. Every single one of us who uses a social media platform that does not offer any type of subscription or we use a free internet service or a free mobile app, we are the product. Our data is being collected because data is free, at least to these companies that want to use it in the ways that they do. You are the product. Always remember that. Anytime you log on to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, again, I'm not trying to call anybody out specifically. I'm just trying to run through the list, but you are the product. Now, no collector, no data collector, I should say, is currently required to compensate people for collecting and using their data. That's just never how it's been, and that's not how it is right now. And in order for the organizations and the data collectors to do this, the user, you, has to authorize this collection through implied consent. And this typically means 
accepting a terms and service agreement that you will never read in your life because it was deliberately crafted to be confusing and long and boring and you just want to use the product or service so you're just going to click through. And if you don't accept these terms of service agreements to use these platforms, you will either not be granted access or they are very deliberate in saying your user experience will suffer greatly probably to the point you won't want to use it anyhow. So, in most cases, the user, you, and your data are the product that is being sold to third parties for advertising or product development purposes. That's what's going on, folks. And again, I, I, I think we all knew this, but it's different when you actually say it, that you are, in fact, the product that is being sold. Well, your data, I guess, is the product that is being sold. Um, and, and of course, the mindset of the data collectors that do this is, well, in order to keep our product and service great for you to use, we need access to all of this data and to collect all this data free of charge and blah, 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 which, yes, I get it to a certain point, but it gets scary and it starts getting intrusive is where it becomes a problem. And we're there right now. We're, we're at that point where it is becoming a real problem, and I'll get into some of that in a bit here. But this goes back, of course, to the saying that has been around for much longer than I've been alive, there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? Nothing is truly free, and there is always a cost passed off to someone with any product or service or entity. The money has to come from somewhere. There is no such thing as a free lunch. This is simple economics. So with that being said, have you ever wondered how companies like Google and Facebook are able to offer their products and services for free? Well, the reason why they're able to be offered for free is because your cost to access the platform is being paid for by you just using the platform. Again, you are the product, your data, and the lack thereof of data privacy is the cost is your fee for using the platform. You and your incredibly valuable data is the most important piece to this puzzle that they have. And that is what keeps these platforms free because they are making so much money off of your data, selling that to third party advertisers or for products and development purposes, which really the products are just sold to you again anyhow. So that that's why they're able to keep all of this at such a low cost or again, mostly free. Now, there is no incentive to keep your data private right now. This is counterintuitive to the entire business model of social media and search engines. There is no incentive to keep your data private, especially when we have no regulation on this, and nobody has even really defined data ownership, which we'll get into in a bit here. But there is no incentive to keep your data private. Why would they want to keep your data private, or why should your data be kept private when so much money is being captured or I should say so much money is being made off of that captured data. It is completely counterintuitive to the entire model. So from a business standpoint, it makes sense. But from a moral and ethical standpoint, it's really bad. Really, really bad. And this, like I just said, is the business of social media and search engines, which are two of the largest businesses on the planet today. So let's dive, of course, into the business model of each really quick. So here is the business of social media. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but it'll, it'll put into perspective how this works from A to Z, I should say, if we're going along the full alphabet. So how does it start, the business of social media? Well, first and foremost, your data is collected. The moment you open one of those apps, the moment you visit a website, your data is collected on your smartphone or your PC. Every click, swipe, tap, touch, scroll, comment, like, time spent on a post, share, photos uploaded, etc., all of it is collected and a personal profile is built of you based on all of this data. Every single thing that you do on a social media platform and even on most websites to some degree are tracked and monitored. After that, your data is sold. Your data is then compiled and sold to third party advertisers who build a unique profile of you and people like you. Why? Because this is the data, and this is what advertisers use to target ads that only you may see. An ad that you get, more than likely someone else may not see. But again, that's the specificity of advertising these days with how much data can be collected. After the data is sold, you get served an ad. 
You are served a personalized ad scrolling through your newsfeed that you may or may not click on, but most likely will at some point, right? I've even done it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've done it. I'm scrolling through something and I see a really creative ad or something, and I just click on it to check out more. At, at some point, you will click on one of these ads. We've all done it. And, of course, there is a massive incentive to social media providers to keep you and your data on the platform because the longer that you're on that platform, the more of your data is being collected. And that is also why we've seen such a massive increase in negative and negative content and clickbait content because right now I think we're addicted to outrage. And when we see negative news, we see clickbait related content that involves negativity on these platforms. We can't help ourselves but to check it out and engage because it's invoking a very primordial response within our brain. I won't get into that, but their goal is to keep you on these platforms as much and as long as possible. Not to mention, the algorithms in social media are gamified, and they're meant to keep you scrolling, just like a Las Vegas slot machine is meant to keep you playing. It's the same exact thing. As a matter of fact, a large chunk of the social media companies employed game experts who helped design the casinos in Las Vegas to create the algorithms that are used in social media to keep you on the platform and to keep the data flowing. And... To put this into perspective, more than 90% of revenue for Facebook-related products and services come purely from ad revenue. Really, when you think about it, yeah, they're a data company, but they're an advertising company. That's essentially what they are, and it's all because of your data and the business of social media. So the business of search engines, very similar to the business of social media. So this you know, includes Google, Bing. I mean, relatively speaking, we're just talking about Google because they own a, a very large portion of the search engine market. But it follows the same path, relatively speaking. Your data is collected. So the moment you open a search engine, you know, every keyword is tracked and tied back to you. Of course, when you go to websites and there's a Google Analytics integration, you know, every page view, every session, every click, scroll, all of that is tracked. So again, when we look at search engines and websites that are tied in with search engines, every single thing you do is tracked and monitored. Again, that data is sold. Your data is then compiled and sold to third-party advertisers who can build a unique profile of you and people like you. And this data is what advertisers use to target ads that not only you may see, well, that you may only see and not others. And when we look at search engines, we're looking at like Google ads, display ads, YouTube ads. Don't be wrong. It's a fantastic business model. But again, at what cost is that business model? Afterwards, last step again, you are served an ad. So whenever you type in a keyword search or a search on YouTube, well, I should say more keyword search, you are served an ad for a website that is most relevant to the keyword search based on the highest bid. And you may not click on it, but at some point you most likely will because why wouldn't you click on the first thing that comes up? It takes more time to have to scroll down and look through all the different websites and different links on the search engine results page. So you're going to click on the ad that's served to you. And of course, there once again is a massive incentive to keep you on a search engine. And when we look at a search engine like Google, it's, it's not about the quality of the information served but rather who has the ability to pay more, right? So just because you're looking for a specific piece of information and Google serves you an ad-sponsored link at the top of the search engine results page, that doesn't mean that the information is great. That doesn't mean that you're getting the right answer. But what it does mean is that company paid the most amount of money to reach that spot on the search engine results page, which is terrifying it dilutes information quality so much and is what contributes to the spread of misinformation because anybody can make anything up and as long as you keep fanning dollars at that and you bid the highest on these keywords your ad will get displayed and people will click on it again more than 80 percent of revenue for google related products and services come purely from ad revenue your data your data that is being collected with very few privacy restrictions google ads and of course this happens on youtube too and we're served ads and all the videos that we watch same exact concept because youtube i believe is the second largest search engine behind google itself so 
These are the business models. And again, I use these platforms freely. Again, this isn't trying to knock them. This, you know, it's just putting it all into perspective for you so you know what is going on. So, with all of that being said, what can be done, right? I mean, this seems like such a monster in itself that has been existing for so long. What can possibly be done to try and fix this and make it better for you, the user who is freely giving up so much data just to be sold stuff to, right? What can be done? And it, it, it's, a question, it's a large question, and I'm not even entirely sure I can answer that, and my goal isn't to answer that. Um, but something needs to change. Data collectors of free services know that if they began to charge, they would lose millions of users overnight. I can bet every single one of you watching, if you woke up tomorrow and Facebook had announced that you had to start paying a monthly subscription fee, or if Google announced that you had to start paying a monthly subscription fee, you wouldn't use it, right? You would not use it. A large percentage of the population would not use it. And that's part of the reason, you know, this, you know, because it's been, we've been accustomed to it being for free so long, but people just wouldn't want to pay for it and they would lose millions of users overnight. And if they lose millions of users, they lose billions of pieces of data that they can sell off to third party advertisers and for product and development purposes. And it's this blatant neglect of data privacy that is leading to far worse outcomes for society as a whole. It is this blatant neglect of helping users to understand how their data is being collected and how it is used that is leading to massive problems that are really just starting to come to light. They've been around for a while, but we're all now just becoming cognizant of them because it is such a big problem. And I think the biggest one is the erosion of trust. Trust is what keeps society together. And in this era of post-truth that we are now living in, where there is a monetary incentive to collect user data and not respect the moral and ethical nature of privacy, there is an incentive to deliberately misinform. And because of that, trust is quickly eroding. If there is a monetary incentive to misinform so data can be collected that can be used to make money, there is the concept of trust goes away, right? Because all of a sudden, we're now being exposed to all this misinformation, and, and we can't trust things anymore, and it erodes the fabric of society. This is such a huge problem. Now, with that be also being said, kind of went on a tangent there, but one a very important tangent. Again, I've identified two ways to tackle this growing issue. And you may not like these ways, but they are the two that I believe can help us work to create a more functioning system of data privacy and data security for everybody. And it's going to take a lot of work. It's like climbing Mount Everest, climbing two Mount Everests, but these are the ways that we can do it. They're very challenging in their own right, but also very possible. The first one, personal responsibility. So that's responsibility on you, that's responsibility on me, that's responsibility of everybody. So when I say personal responsibility, I mean you, the user, deciding to be cognizant of what is happening and take your control back. As much as you don't want to, read the terms and conditions of the platforms that you're using and do not agree just for the sake of being able to use something. I know that's very hard and these terms of services are awful to read. These privacy policies are awful to read. But having gone through some of them for some work that I'm doing at the Open Voice Network, if you read Facebooks, you wouldn't be on it. That's 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 just the truth. I mean, they collect so much that you don't even know about, and it's all buried in these privacy policies in terms of service agreements. But if you don't agree with something that you read, don't use it. Let your ethics and morals shine and protect yourself. Don't use it. Also, use the various resources that are at your disposal today to keep your data private. Instead of using Google Chrome, which is funny because I'm using Google Chrome right now, but that's besides the point. But instead of using Google Chrome or using Google Search Engine, use a Tor browser. I use Tor browsers all the time. Use DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is a, is, a, is a search engine that does not collect and sell off your data like Google does. I've actually used DuckDuckGo, and 
I, I would highly recommend it. I, of course, still use Google just because we all use Google, but DuckDuckGo is a great alternative if you want to protect the data that is going into the search engine. And then, of course, review your privacy settings within your iPhone or Android. Apple just released a new software update a few weeks ago that pretty much allows you to keep your data from being tracked by apps across multiple websites. Go into conversion tracking in your privacy settings and deny them all because they don't need it. They shouldn't need it, right? So there are things you can do. And on top of that, know your right to data privacy as a consumer. You coming to this today is a great step to learn about what's going on and how you can take that control back. But know your right to data privacy as a consumer based on the regulations that do exist today. And of course, speak up and demand stricter data privacy regulations that give us all more power back. Because if we don't, we're going to keep diving deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole of data collection. And it is going to continue to be abused. I know it may seem like a long shot. There's a lot going on in Capitol Hill right now. But write to your legislators, write to Congress, write to your state government, and demand that we start taking action to protect people, protect consumers, protect their data privacy, and write to privacy. It is a right. It is a right. Remember that. Regulation. This is number two. And I say regulation because I am a firm believer that when regulation is deployed properly, it works very well. It works very, very well when it is used properly. Appropriate and reasonable laws and regulations that protect consumers first is a great starting point to continue, well, not to continue, but to begin protecting our data privacy a lot more than it is being protected now. Because right now, there is no incentive to change how data is collected and used unless the entities that collect the data are forced to change their ways, and that comes the regulation. Few regulations currently exist, but the ones that do are powerful in a number of ways. So just so you are aware, here are four core data privacy regulations that exist both in the US and the European Union right now. So of course we have HIPAA, we have GDPR, we have CCPA, and we have COPRA, which isn't technically an official regulation, but it is a piece of legislation traveling through the federal government right now that will create blanket data privacy protection similar to GDPR in the United States. So let's dive into one of the each one of these really quickly. So HIPAA, of course, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was signed into law in 1996. It was created primarily to modernize the flow of healthcare information, stipulate how PII is maintained by healthcare and health insurance industries, and how it should be protected from fraud and theft, and of course addresses limitations on health insurance coverage. Even though we don't have, of course, a blanket data privacy protection for consumers, at least we did something for healthcare, because that's incredibly important. And HIPAA protects us in so many ways that a lot of us can't even fathom when it comes to our healthcare data and how it is used and how it is treated. The second one is GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation. This exists primarily within the European Union and the European Economic Area. However, it does apply to anybody who does business with the EU as well. So it actually is a pseudo-global regulation, I suppose, because if you do business with anybody in the European Union, you have to abide by GDPR. And the regulation contains provisions and requirements related to the processing of personal data for individuals uh, who are located in the European economic area. And of course, applies to any enterprise, regardless of its location, and the data subject citizenship or residence. Um, so GDPR was a landmark data privacy regulation, has impacted a lot of things both in the EU and domestically here in the United States and all around the world. And truthfully, if we could have something like GDPR that is you know, global and outside of the EU, that would be the dream. Um, but of course, there are still some issues with that, you know, enforcement and data still isn't, data ownership still hasn't been defined. I could go on. The third one is CCPA or the California Consumer Privacy Act. This is the first attempt by a state in the United States to protect privacy rights of individual citizens when it comes to data collection. Of course, it only applies to residents of the state of California. But again, if you do business in California as a data collector, you have to abide by this. So you may notice with some of the larger companies, really every company, they have a specific clause within their privacy policy for CCPA. And lastly here, we have COPRA, 
which is the Consumer Online Privacy Rights Act, which is a proposed federal law. Proposed is the key thing there. It is not official. It is proposed to give American citizens control over their personal data. And it essentially is is meant to be a much grander extension of what exists within the California Consumer Privacy Act. And it, it very strongly believes in these inherent rights that we have when it comes to data collection. It gives Americans control over their personal data, prohibits companies from using consumers' data to harm or deceive them, establishes strict standards for the collection, use, and sharing and protection of consumer data. It protects civil rights and penalizes companies that fail to meet data protection standards. And it also codifies the rights of you, the rights of me, the rights of everybody who lives in the United States to pursue claims against entities that violate their data privacy rights. I do not care what side of the aisle you are on. There is no reason why everyone should not want to support this because we are all affected by data privacy issues. All of our data is being collected. We all should have an inherent right to privacy, control our data, know how it is being used, and tell data collectors when we don't want it used to stop. All right, again, bit of a tangent there. I got really into that one, but I, it's just there's, there's no reason not to support that. So it's currently circulating Capitol Hill right now. We'll see what happens to it. Uh, I can provide you information if you want to look more into that one. But again, I think a, a key thing to understand here as well, why this discussion is so important, is I love this quote from Miko Hyponen, who is the founder of F-Secure, one of the leading cybersecurity firms in the world, is that cyber weapons are in a way the perfect weapons. They get the job done, they are cost effective, and they are deniable. And we cyber warfare and cyber weaponry wouldn't exist without all of this data. Right? The only reason you conduct cyber warfare is because of how connected things are and because of how much data is circulating through our world at any given point in time. And our current climate, or lack thereof, of data privacy is the perfect storm for nefarious actors and state-sponsored actors to use data to cause harm. We've already seen this happen multiple, multiple times since the start of the 21st century. Of course, we have what happened with Cambridge Analytica in 2016 and the weaponizing of social media to influence politics. This year, we have the Solar Winds hack where foreign actors were able to use a security flaw within an enterprise uh, data security company and infiltrate government agencies, which is terrifying. And these data breaches are only getting more numerous and worse. And it's, again, because of this lack of regulation, lack of understanding from the general public, lack of any type of data privacy and strict data security, which is why this is such a problem. And because there is such a lack of control, a lack of user control, this leaves a huge liability and the risk of even more severe data breaches and more severe hacks and more severe cyber warfare is only going to get worse unless we tackle these issues. And just to put it into perspective, again, since we've hit the 21st century, some of the largest data breaches that we've had. So the last two decades have seen some of the largest and most detrimental cyber attacks in modern history. Of course, we had solar winds and Colonial Pipeline that just happened this year. Colonial Pipeline, of course, creating that massive panic of fuel in the southeastern United States. But let's go back to 2009 when Heartland Payment Systems, one of the largest credit card processing companies, they had a, had, a, had, a, had, a, had, a, had a very bad data breach, 130 million affected users, and they're a credit card processing company. Of course, one of the more well-known ones is 2011 with Sony PlayStation Network, where hackers infiltrated the network and were able to take a lot of credit card information and personally identifying information, 77 million affected users. Then, of course, we had Target Corp in 2013 that actually changed a lot of things, uh, 70 million affected users. Uh, JP Morgan Chase in 2014, 76 million affected users. And then, of course, more recently, we had the Equifax hack, which affected 143 million affected users, and they got access to incredibly sensitive personally identifying information. So this is a problem. This gray area that we're living in with lack of control, lack of regulation is creating a massive, massive problem. And I think the bigger question that still has not been answered, given all of this, is who owns the data? Who owns the data? No one knows. 
No one, no one actually knows who owns the data. And it hasn't been officially defined. No government entity, no private company has yet to officially define data ownership. Every user and every data collector or data processor is operating in a gray space that no one wants to touch with a million foot pole. Why? Because the moment you define data ownership, a lot of money can be affected. A lot of money is on the line here, which is why nobody wants to touch it. So I guess I pose the question to you, if you want to drop it in the comments or wherever you're watching this, who do you think owns the data? Do you think you own the data because you create it? Or does the company own the data because without using the company's platform or product, the data wouldn't be created anyhow? And that's kind of the vicious cycle of this, right? One cannot exist without the other. The user who creates the data wouldn't be creating the data unless they were using the platform or the service that the data was being created for. Does that make sense? I, I, it took me a while to grasp that as well. But one cannot exist without the other. And this is one of the key fundamental issues of this whole dilemma is who owns the data. I hope we define that. I would love to define that. But there is, there is a reason it is not being defined. It's because there is a lot of money on the line. And the moment it is defined, everything changes. Everything changes. But one idea I would like to toss past, toss by you, and, and this is one that I've thought a lot about over the last several months, is in a perfect world where we had proper data privacy regulation, data security regulation, imagine getting paid for your data. Just imagine for a second. Imagine going to a marketplace, more than likely online, where you as the user can freely opt in to share your data. And when you opt in to share your data, collectors pay you for that data. Instead of right now, where it's just implied that they get to collect it because they're using their platform. Imagine getting paid for your data. Again, this would have to be regulated appropriately. Everybody would have to agree. There'd have to be a lot of buy-in. But just imagine for a second. You get a yearly or annual check for your data. It would be a safe, secure, and private way for users to get compensated for the value of their data and an efficient way for collectors to find and get the data they need. Honestly, it would be a universal basic income for everyone because anybody could opt into this system, right? And if you don't want to be a part of it, you don't have to be, which is brilliant. You don't have to have your data collected without agreeing to it. But if you want to share your data, you can then get paid for it. You can get compensated. This would lift so many people out of poverty. This would give everybody an opportunity to create money just by sharing their data. Now, of course, in this perfect utopia, the big question is who would run it? It would only work with enforcement and regulation. We probably wouldn't want the government to run it, and we probably wouldn't want a private entity to run it. So that's a very big question. But this more or less was just to get you thinking of imagine what it would be like to get compensated for all of your data. So as we wind this talk down and this discussion down, it's important to remember that data powers the world. And I've said this in many other talks I've given, but data is the new oil. Excuse me. And is more valuable than oil, I think, in every way, shape, and form. And our world is being rapidly transformed by all of this data. And look at how much humanity has been transformed in the last 40 years with the rise of personal computing and all of this data collection, imagine what the next 40 years are going to look like. Humanity is going to be impacted in ways that we cannot even guess yet. And as more and more data is produced by the second, it is crucial, crucial, that all of the data is not held in the hands of the few. We know what society is like right now when power and different things are held in the hands of the few. We cannot afford we cannot afford to let that happen with data. We need ease of access, we need control, and we need transparency. All of these things are the key to the future of society where data flows in and out of everything around us. We need that. We need that in order to maintain trust, in order to maintain, in order to maintain a proper system where this data is being collected every single second. We need ease of access, control, and above all, we need transparency. So it's time to demand 
for better. It really is. It's time to demand for better. You know, although I am a tech startup founder, and I guess I call myself a tech evangelist, I believe in the moral and ethical use of data to better serve humanity. Again, my opinion has been changed from what it used to be. I used to be the biggest proponent of, oh, just let the data be collected. It creates better products and services. But no, I'm not that person anymore. We need better. We need an ethical use of data to better serve humanity. And the longer we let the current system exist, the harder it will be to break out of it. And the more damage we risk causing to society that will be irreparable. It'll be irreparable. So by attending this talk today, you've started this journey now. And now is the time to act. Invoke your personal responsibility, use the rights that you have, and demand proper regulation from the people we put in power to represent us to benefit everybody, to benefit every user, every consumer that has data collected on them from using a product or service where data is the primary form of monetization. It's time to demand for better. And with that, I say stay hungry, stay foolish. I am so grateful to finally say take, you should always stay safe, but I used to put stay safe in there as well, of course, because when I would give these talks during the pandemic, but things are looking up there. So stay hungry, stay foolish. If you're interested in checking out our podcast, you can listen to the Artificial Podcast wherever you listen to Pi, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher. You can also listen on our website, but we release new episodes every Sunday. So if you're interested, please feel free to check us out. Again, we're, all, we're also on YouTube. So if you search for the Artificial Podcast on YouTube, you can find all the video episodes of the podcast. And with that, questions. Thank you very much for your time. And I really hope you're able to take a lot away from this talk. Thanks so much for that, Nick. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. Like Nick said, go ahead and get any, any questions in um, if you have any for Nick. Nick's also done a few of these uh, events during the pandemic. So go ahead over to our Facebook page. Um, if you aren't already, press that events tab. Go ahead and search his name. He's got a couple other events uh, that we have up there as well, too. Um, also, while you're there, it's a, a good, concise list of everything that we have coming up in the next couple months, as well as everything we've done since about the beginning or the, excuse me, the end of March of, of 2020 um, as well. Really a kind of a deep dive into a lot of different topics, uh, as well as a, a breadth of, of various topics as well, too. Um, Nick, it doesn't look like there's any questions that have come in yet. Um, so we'll go ahead and cap it there. Again, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Nick, for putting together this presentation. And we will see you all next time.